All right. Excellent. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back. Yes, uh, I'm Leo, and uh, I was your uh, former chairman from 2018 to 2020, and now I'm serving as your branch ambassador. And uh, it's been a while since I was last here to give a presentation uh, because of uh, some unavoidable circumstances. But anyhow, uh, welcome to this uh, monthly meeting and uh, continuing professional development uh, CPD scheme. And uh, I decided to give this topic. Historically speaking, this was planned, I think, more than five years ago uh, during the previous two uh, chairpersons when we talk about um, this subject and they said, they told me that, uh, yes, uh, maybe one day you will be able to present that topic given a chance. So here I am tonight um, to give you uh, a little bit, not, not, this is not really a very comprehensive talk about uh, emotional intelligence, but I just want to uh, give you somewhat of, of a touch of what emotional intelligence is and how can we, how can we connect this in our uh, risk and the safety practice. So the objectives, um, we will just try to revisit the basic international concept of occupational safety and health. We will also try to look at the relationship of emotions in the exercise of safety. And we will see how important is it for a safety practitioner to look at these emotions in the aspect of uh, health and safety. And then we will look at uh, the uh, emotional intelligence concept um, by uh, uh, from different uh, sources, different authors, and we will also try to relate emotional intelligence to the workplace. And finally, we will be looking at the challenges and how to effectively uh, impact emotional intelligence to others. So these are our uh, straightforward objectives. Uh, bear with me. Um, I will be asking you um, to answer some questions. I will also be asking you to analyze one scenario here. So I want you to read this scenario. I'll give you a few seconds to take a look at this uh, while I'm reading it. Perhaps you can listen to me. Um, during an, an announced safety rounds, a newly hired safety manager noticed that several workers were not complying to the PPA requirement as posted at the entrance of the project site. The assigned safety officer was called to the office and was questioned. In return, the safety officer scolded the workers and the workers ended up confronting their foreman and the foreman blamed the safety officer for the lack of support. The war continued, but noticeable and safe behavior dashed out between the workers, foreman and the safety officer. So I don't know if you've already read the scenario. So here's the question that I want to I want you to contemplate on what went wrong and what can further go wrong if we, if you try to look at the scenario. What do you think went wrong here? Um, why why did the workers end up uh, in noticeable and safe behavior and and things that that uh, popped out between the workers, the foreman, and the safety officer? What what do you think? And do you think something can can escalate as as they progress to uh, carrying out their task as a, as a staff, as workers. So let's let's move on, and as we progress, let's try to uh, somewhat get back to this uh, scenario. And at the end of my presentation, uh, there will be some uh, uh, part of the slides, part of my presentation, which will correlate or which will answer this scenario. Now. If I ask you this question, what are the most common emotions that you can that you can find at your workplace? Maybe some of you are smiling now. Um, maybe some of you are already looking at the ceiling, looking at the facing in the blank wall, and maybe you're trying to recall now, uh, as per your experience, the different emotions that you you can find at the workplace. So, at the workplace, these are what we can see: people who are happy, right? People who are saying, I'm okay, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm doing well. There are also people who are sad uh, for whatever reason. And there are also some people who wants to take a time out because um, they, 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 they feel like they're losing something already. And there are also people who are stressed. And maybe some of you are saying, well, I'm that last one feeling stressed right now. So if, if I'm correct, 
these are just four examples of the most common emotions that people expresses at the workplace, if I'm right. Uh, personally, yes, I've witnessed people um, uh, projecting an image, projecting themselves to be a happy employee. And I've seen people who whom you can really say this person looks sad. And I spoke to people who wanted a time out. And of course, I can I will be able to I, I know how people looks like when they are stressed. And um, I guess uh, uh, many of you here uh, you can you can tell us or you can uh, say to yourself, yes, I've witnessed or I've seen these kinds of emotions at the workplace. So when we talk about workplace emotions and the practice of safety, we have to remember that an emotion is a very significant predictor of workplace risk. Well, um, we we always we always talk about risk and safety, uh, not to mention about the word hazard, but when we talk about emotion, emotion is a very dangerous thing if you put it in a negative context, right? On the other hand, that emotion can spread throughout groups like pollen born on wind. Whether, it, whether the person is, is, is a happy worker, he can become contagious. Whether a person is um, feeling stressed, that person can also be a contagious person. That emotion can, can contaminate other people. So emotional contamination is what we will be able to discover when one emotion spreads towards another person. And the risk is if this emotion is a negative emotion, that will uh, eventually lead to um, unsafe acts, uh, unsafe behavior, and thereby creating an unsafe working condition. This gets undetected and functions through uh, inherent predisposition to imitate other people's emotion. This is according to Newman and Strack in their paper in 2000. So I, I, I want you to just, to just capture, capture this, this slide. And, and think about and think about in your workplace, if you've seen people emoting negatively, was there a chance that you discover that that negative emotion was able to contaminate or to affect other people? I want you to take note of that because later on we will be we will be uh, uh, traversing the different uh, kinds of. Uh, um, uh, elements when we talk about uh, emotional intelligence. Now, as as in the objective that we'll be revisiting the basic concept at that international perspective, the um, uh, occupational health and safety. So again, we will just try to uh, refresh our memories with the definition of occupational safety and health according to International Labor Organization. Um, safety is all about thinking of it as a science of anticipating recognizing, evaluating, and controlling of hazards. And of course, let's not forget hazards and their associated risk arising in or from the workplace that can disable, that can uh, adversely impact the health and well-being of workers, taking into account the possible impact on the surrounding communities and the general environment. So when we talk about, uh, when we talk about what we're doing, uh, risk and safety management, we're basically talking about workplace but we can think of workplace and beyond so um guys are you not happy that uh, we are considered a scientist yes by virtue of the definition of uh, uh, international labor organization we are scientists uh we we anticipate we recognize we evaluate and we put control to hazards and their associated risk uh, arising in or from the workplace so that's basically uh, from the uh, the definition of occupational uh, safety and health. But but let, let's try to go a little bit farther. The word occupational here and health it has been given definition by World Health Organization and International Labor Organization. Occupational means something that relates to a person's job or profession. So in this context, we will be talking about emotional intelligence in the context of risk and safety. How do people behave? How do we see? How do we look at the different emotions and the level of emotional intelligence or the, the, the emotional quotient of a person while he's at work? Now, 
Health here pertains to a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So I guess, I guess in the last five years, we've been talking about mental health. We've been talking about um, uh, uh, well-being. And there's a lot of people, if you look at them, they don't have any physical infirmity. But if if you... If you start to talk to these people, at times you will get to discover that they have some sort of um, mental problem, they have some sort of emotional problem, in spite of the fact that they look uh, so healthy, so uh, physically uh, prepared to do things. So this is this is one very important thing that we also have to bear in mind. Um, health is not only the absence of disease or infirmity, but it should be a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Now, again, the aim of occupational health, according to International Labor Organization, Organization and World Health Organization, is all about to promote and maintain to the highest degree of physical, mental, and social well-being of workers in all occupations. So whatever trade you are in, whatever trade the person is in, the mental and social well-being is so important in all occupations, whether the person is working in, in a supermarket, the person is working uh, in a construction, um, uh, in healthcare. Um, the main goal of, of ILO and WHO is to promote and to maintain to the highest degree of uh, physical, mental, and social well-being. So I, 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 I'm, I'm emphasizing here two things, mental and social well-being. So we're talking about the way people think and the way people behave. Now. Another thing that I want to revisit is, of course, the operational elements of any business. We we all know we all know that a business could not run without people. A business could not run without equipment. A business with cannot run without materials. And more so, the environment is a very important operational element of any business uh, entity. Now, the reason why I'm trying to emphasize this because I want you to look at this slide as well. When you talk about operational elements of of a business, we also have to think about the relationship of emotions at work. Now, of course, it's it's the, the people element who runs the business. It's the people element who's responsible for the equipment, responsible for materials, and responsible for the environment. Even if we'll say the environment is made up again of people, equipment, and materials, the, the thing is we have to remember that when the emotion of the workers are affected, most likely all of these things will also be affected and the, the 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 effect the effect to these three other elements for sure will have something to do with productivity will have something to do with quality so if you look at if you look at the square of a business you know that in the square of the business we always have equal side of uh, uh, quality assurance of quality control uh, finance uh, what else? Uh, timeline and of course health and safety. So it's 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 the same thing that when health and safety, because the people's emotions are already affected adversely by what's happening at the workplace, it will be guaranteed that the other side, the other side of that of that of that business square will also be affected. The same thing is true with the operational element. So here it's really very uh, captivating to, to to think that the emotions of the people at work is so important to consider because they can damage the equipment they can misuse the materials and they can spoil the environment as well now what what what's the goal what's our goal at the workplace we always we always aim we always aspire that a workplace should be safe and the worker should be safe and we have we have tried to modify the hierarchy of uh, control measures, um, calling it as uh, Eric PD. I, I guess some people who, who have had their uh, uh, nibos are so familiar with this, and I have been using this uh, for so so long a time already. But I want you to 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 reconsider here applying this in uh, uh, in the aspect of emotional intelligence because here in the last part which is the discipline and emphasizing it to have the elements as information instruction training and supervision this is really where emotional intelligence comes in this is where it comes in the in in the discipline element of 
uh, our workplace risk and safety goal. So I want you to look into this. This will bring us into the local legal framework here in Qatar, of which we're using the Qatar Construction Specification of 2014, particularly in Section 11, which talks about health and safety, and Part 102, which talks about occupational health and hygiene, which is of which this document is considered as a regulatory document. Now, 1.2.1 1 of QCS 2014 emphasizes the management of health on site. And here in the introduction, it's, it's saying that one of the reasons why contractors have safe systems of work is to avoid accidents and to keep employees at work instead of being off sick. And the benefit of coming up with with a robust management uh, uh, health management system is that it can benefit the the it can benefit and both the business comprising of those four operational elements and the management can have an assurance that they are compliant to legal requirement of course when we talk about legal requirements here in qatar there are so many laws when it comes to health and safety to risk and safety that we can consider like for example the uh uh, law number 18 of 2005, which is about reporting of injuries. Law number 20 of 2005, which talks about risk assessment or about protecting the workers. And of course, economically speaking, if you're not going to look at the mental health, the, the, the health aspect of the business on site, business will, will, will lose money. Um, you, you might you might end up having injuries, you might end up having sick people, and the social and moral terms will also be affected. There will be no there will be no good relationship among the people and there will be very low morale if people keeps on getting injured and if there's not enough uh, support from the management when it comes to managing, their health on site. So this is just this is just part of it. Another thing is um, the sub paragraph 1.2.1.5, which talks about stress. So we we all know that there are so many there are so many um, things that can cause a person to become stressed out, and this is one of the growing problem that has not been widely recognized or generally accepted within uh, Qatar building and construction industry. And I guess most of us can start thinking about this now by referring to ourselves with regards to um, gauging uh, how much stress are you experiencing nowadays, not, not to mention the, the uh, um, uh, contributory factors around us, but, but, but by just thinking where we are standing right now, uh, what is our... Uh, what what awaits us for tomorrow in this place when it comes to um, um, construction works? Really, I can say that it, it, it's all about us. It should emanate, gauging stress should emanate from us, should start from us before we go outside of ourselves and looking at people, gauging how stressed the people are, and then looking towards the requirement, the legal requirement of uh, QCS about uh, health management. So we all know very well that stress can cause a lot of problems and uh, not to mention not to mention the uh, uh, the uh, different uh, uh, physical problems that uh, stress can end can end up can have us ending up to. Uh, there are so many things here. Um, but I just want to proceed to the next slide which is here. Um, we'll refer to uh, uh, the uh, last element of the um, our aim at the workplace, uh, of which we want to have a safe worker and a safe workplace. And here in paragraph three, uh, Qatar Construction Specification mentions that work-related factors that lead to stress can be managed, but this will require I want everyone to read this. If you are with me right now, I want you to read the word here, appropriate training. For what? For management. Of course, we safety people, we are the representative of the management of the frontliners. We are the bridge of the frontliners towards the management, the upper management. And here the operatives means the frontline people, the workers. Because if we don't provide appropriate training and 
stress is left unchecked, this will end up to all of this from A to F. Particularly here, um, heart problems, of course, emotions, uh, emotions come come from from the heart, and mental illness is also um, one very one very remarkable uh, problem here that may arise if we don't provide training to them. So I'm not going to read uh, paragraph four anymore, but I'm going to bring you into this uh, statement number five which are the things that can be done to avoid or prevent stress. So management related things. I, 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 I have emphasized here some phrases for us to capture, uh, such as the fostering of good relationships between staff and management. So here, good relationship. Again, let me just reiterate that we safety people, we are the link, we are the representative of the management towards the frontliner, and we are the bridge of the frontliner towards the upper management. And if you can set a clear and achievable objectives, the better for all the people involved in the organization. And of course, communications. I also want you to capture the word communications here. Employee involvement, employee engagement. How do we engage them? The problem is we cannot, we will not be able to engage, to involve the workers if we do not know their emotions, if we do not know how they feel. And sometimes even if if that emotion manifests outright, if we do not, if we do not know how to gauge how deep how how low how high is that uh, uh, emotion especially um, negative emotion that the worker is experiencing it will be difficult for us to involve these people next is good management support so again this will bring us back to our role being the management representative and being the bridge and staff training. So repeatedly the word training here is uh, emphasized because this is one of the requirements. So perhaps we have some, some uh, training uh, instructors here, some safety training officer. You need to, you need to capture this uh, last element here to have management related um, uh, things to prevent stress at the workplace as per the QCS 2014. So um, I, I found I found I found this um, uh, slide uh, very interesting when I was browsing in one of my references. This was uh, I, I found this in a Quantum Workplace publication. Uh, there's this question of uh, do employees feel comfortable showing their emotions at work? So I want you to look at the the, the graph here um, and, and just look at here immediate co-workers. So for us risk and safety practitioners, we are most we are if not most of the time, uh, oftentimes we are exposed directly to our co-workers either in the office or either at the front line at the project site. And this is very interesting here because although it is it, not it, it, the article did not say that um, um, did the worker really express, but the research just says um, employees feeling comfortably showing their emotions at work. So um, whether it is a sad emotion, a stressed out emotion, a happy emotion, or an emotion that requires time out, what's important here is the emotion at the emotion of the worker at work that he that he comfortably feel share, showing it to their co-workers. So this is very interesting. Uh, this was released uh, in 2019 by Dr. Dan Harris, and it was uh, published in. Uh, uh, quantum workplace uh, magazine so again I, I want you also to, to not really to benchmark but just to to look at this figure here 73 percent of the immediate co-workers they feel comfortable showing their emotions at work but of course we have we have to if we're going to do that we need to find out what kind of emotion that uh, really are the really the, the workers showing to others now um, in in carrying out any project we always aim for operational success and that success are dependent on four very important things just like uh, when we talk about um, uh, disaster management 
or crisis management. These forces are very, um, what do you, what do I call it? Uh, are very uh, uh, remarkable uh, words for us to remember. Communication is very important. If uh, uh, communication requires a lot of uh, what do you call this? Uh, a lot of um, uh, effort to really express um, things that people want to relate to one another, uh, either verbally, either we communicate in, in, in a lot of ways. We send email, we send text messages, uh, but we create WhatsApp group, uh, we post memos, we, we send the uh, announcement. So failure to communicate will also affect the operational success of the work at the workplace. We want each one to cooperate. If, if you want to implement something and you want people to comply, we want people to cooperate with us. Otherwise, the lack of cooperation will also mean um, uh, failure of, uh, failure of uh, what you want to achieve. And, and more so, we want to collaborate with uh, other people. If, if you are a safety supervisor, if you are a safety manager, you want to collaborate with the uh, uh, frontline supervisors, the foremen. Um, fail, failure to do so, what, what do you think will happen? There will be that lack of trust, there will, there will be that lack of compliance, and all of us will be affected. And lastly, we need to coordinate with each other. If we want to implement something, if we want to uh, conduct an audit, an inspection, we want to coordinate it with the right people so that people will be working with us and we will be, uh, uh, we will be dancing in the same music um, all together. So these are the four uh, very important dependencies of workplace operational success. And you will see later on how will this link to uh, emotional intelligence in the practice of health and safety. Emotion alone, uh, communication alone is already one very important element of uh, the dependencies um, that you can correlate to emotional intelligence. So let's now talk about emotional intelligence as it is defined emotional intelligence is the person's ability to understand and manage his mind yours emotions and feelings as well as those of others so just try to to figure out you're in one project and you're handling let's say around um 20 safety officers or you're handling a small project and you're, you, you have under you, let's say four or five safety officers, safety engineers, safety supervisors. Question now is, um, have, you, have you realized or have you started thinking about your own ability in understanding the emotions and feelings of others? The next question is, have you already started or have you at one point in your being a safety manager, safety supervisor, a safety leader, have you at one point tried to manage your own emotions and feelings? Yours first, ours first before others. Okay. So that's what emotional intelligence is all about. It's all about our, our ability, our capacity to understand and manage our own emotions and feelings and those of others. Now, um, just a little bit of history of emotional intelligence. Uh, in 1930, uh, psychologist uh, Edward Thorndike described the concept of social intelligence as the ability to have a good relationship with people. So, uh, so social um, engagement, um, social uh, um, mix the mixing of people um, in 1930s was described to be a concept of social intelligence, a concept of having good relationship with other people. And in 1940, another psychologist, uh, David uh, Wessler, proposed that different effective components of intelligence could play an important role in how successful people are in life. And this is where we can see uh, uh, social intelligence, um, uh, intelligence quotient, uh, and, and, and a whole a lot more of uh, types of uh, uh, intelligence that could play important role. In the 1950s, 
the rise of school of thought known as humanistic psychology and thinkers such as uh, Abraham Maslow. I guess you're so familiar with uh, Abraham Maslow, uh, the uh, hierarchy of needs, right? Uh, from physiological needs to to uh, uh, security to safety to uh, esteem and self actualization. So uh, they focused on greater attention on the different ways that people could build emotional strength. So take note here that in 1950s they started to think that the five the five the hierarchy of needs uh, could build up emotional strength for uh, individuals. So again, uh, perhaps uh, even until now, if you say that uh, uh, a person is well provided uh, physiologically, uh, he has everything, he's secured, he's safe, uh, I don't see any reason why a person could not have uh, good or high self-esteem. And if a person has high self-esteem, there's no question why a person cannot have uh, can end, cannot end up being successful or having that self-actualization. So that was in 1950s. However, in 1970s, another psychologist, uh, Howard Gardner, introduced the idea that intelligence was more than just a single general ability. So it was just more than uh, a single general ability. There's, there's a lot more into uh, that intelligence. So in 1985, the term emotional intelligence was first introduced by by uh, two uh, uh, persons actually in their doctoral dissertation, and it was uh, Wayne Payne uh, who, who who started to write on this. And in 1987, there was an article published in a magazine where uh, Keith Beasley used the term emotional quotient. So uh, don't don't get confused with two terms here: emotional quotient and emotional intelligence. And it was in 1990 when psychologists uh, Salovey and uh, John Mayer published their landmark article about emotional intelligence in one journal. And in 1995. Emotional intelligence was popularized, um, became popular after Daniel Goleman uh, released or published a book about emotional intelligence. And <clears throat> it's all about a question of why it can matter more than uh, intelligence quotient. So this, this is just a simple history of how impo em uh, emotional intelligence started and where is it right now in the practice of uh, uh, human relations, uh, and now we're trying to put it in the context of the practice of risk and safety, because we as safety, risk and safety practitioners, um, day in, day out, we connect with people, isn't it? And also, as long as we, we as long as we, we, we work as uh, safety, safety practitioners, the connection between the people, the equipment, the materials in the environment is never ending day in day out it will always revolve around those four elements our lives will always revolve around those four elements so let's try to look at the uh, uh th there are five actually but uh daniel goldman uh in in his paper just just uh came out with four very important uh, characteristics of uh, emotional intelligence here. So the first one is self-awareness. Self-awareness is what is known to be the ability of, of a person to recognize and understand moods, emotions, and the enthusiasm. And of course, the effect to other people. So when, when, you, when, when you are self-aware, you don't let your emotions get out of control. Like, for example, uh, how many of you here have uh, experienced or have run out of control with your emotions in a project site where unknowingly you shouted to one person? I, I guess we're all guilty of this. Or if, if you may not have shouted to one worker or one person, you, you somewhat feel feel bad about that person for whatever reason self-awareness is also about knowing our strength our weaknesses and how we work on them so that we can we can perform better or we can we can enhance what we have it's also a demonstration of a thirst or or um hunger for constructive criticism we we uh this is uh 
uh, the third, this is the third of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs about belongingness. If, if, if you want to be praised in somewhat, if you want to be rewarded somewhat, it's also, it's also about self-awareness and knowing when to ask for help. Self-awareness is also knowing when to ask for help. Uh, as the song says, uh, no man is an island, we cannot live without asking for help. Now, it's some important important things here that that are that are uh, so important with self-awareness is that um, there should be a, a trademark there should be a brand uh, that we, we we are able to build self-confidence and once in a while we conduct realistic self-assessment and then uh, self depreciating sense of humor um if do you have that that sense of humor or uh each one of us we know we know when when we can inject sense of humor or we know if if the way we express things that we feel humorous is really humorous to other people so that's what uh, self awareness is all about and secondly this is about self management or self regulation uh, first one is being aware of ourselves. The second one is how do we regulate? How do we manage ourselves? It is all about our ability to control or to redirect our disruptive impulses and moods. Like for example, you're you're driving, you're you're on your way to to driving towards your work, and you're in a queue. You're in a queue where uh, that line is about to turn right to enter a gate, and suddenly someone cuts you off pushing him himself to be uh, in the line ahead of you. Um, how do you manage that? So I guess, again, maybe in one way or another, some of us here have experienced have experienced running out of control and, and uh, we fail to redirect our disrupt, disruptive moods. And uh, even inside the car, although you know that nobody is listening to you, you shout, you shout inside your vehicle, right? Or sometimes you even hit your steering wheel. And it's also a propensity to suspend judgment, to think before we act. So self-management or self-regulation. And it's also defined as our ability to create an environment of trust and fairness. So I want to emphasize here three things, justice, fairness, and equality plus trust. And that will, that will uh, result to us having that integrity as a respected or a respectable safety risk and safety practitioner. Now, what are the the trademarks here um, that that are that are the brands uh, that that we can be remembered? It's all about being a, a trustworthy uh, risk and safety professional with with an integrity uh, about uh, it's all about uh, ha having comfort with ambiguity um, that we it, we can we can easily we can easily adapt to things that are so broad for us and of course our openness to change if if you have if you are a close minded person you cannot be open to change so that should be the brand that should be the trademark of a person who knows how to regulate or who knows how to manage himself and then the third one is about being aware of of of, of the environment social awareness so this is this is defined by by daniel goldman as our ability to understand the emotional makeup of other people. So again, we are now looking at things in front of us, at things on our side, at things behind us. In other words, in our, in 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 our surroundings. So how much how much do we uh, do we understand of the emotions of other people? That that's a very that's a very serious question because it's so difficult to gauge other person's emotion if we don't even know our emotions ourselves, and it's so difficult to manage other people's emotion if we cannot even understand our own emotion. This is also our skill in treating people according to their emotional reactions. Are we are we treating workers as children? Are we treating them as our pupils inside the classroom? That if you feel that things are not pleasant to you, you can just simply shout at them. At, at the expense of their emotion and without thinking that if we are in the shoes of that people and, and, and someone is shouting at us, I, I do not know how would we react. 
And it's also our ability to identify with and understand the wants, the needs, and the viewpoints of others. In other words, this is about the word empathy. So uh, you might ask uh, the difference between sympathy and empathy. Empathy goes deeper than 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 uh, than sympathy. Okay. Um, you you express more of your emotions um, without even uh, uh, showing that to to a person. Whereas when you sympathize with a person, you express it. But empathy goes deeper than just sympathy. This is also social awareness is also our excellence at managing relationship. Like for example, re listening and relating to others. Guys, I, I also want you to capture the word here, listening. You know. Just, 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 just try to think about this. When you give instruction, like for example, corrective, random corrective measures, how would that feel for you if you've said around five to seven statements and at the end of the last word in the seventh sentence, the person in front of you or the people in front of you are just opening their mouth as if they were starstruck with what you were telling them and at the end of, of your conversation with them, nothing was understood. So they say it's, 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 it's the same thing about, about the way you understand their emotion when, when you try to relate something to them in terms of compliance to uh, health and safety standards. Also, social awareness is about avoidance of stereotyping or judging too quickly. So again, this is I, I i guess this is this is where the context of um the two impressions of hazards the impression of the person uh let's just use the word unsafe act or unsafe condition just just the word just the phrase unsafe condition if you're doing your rounds and then you notice something that in your in in your judgment it's unsafe do you just right away judge too quickly that indeed what you've seen is indeed unsafe? How about if after after communi communicating or engaging the owner of what is known to be an unsafe condition tells you that I know it is unsafe, but here is my control measure. I, I hope you get what I mean. So being socially aware is avoidance of stereotyping, is avoidance of judging too quickly. And one classic example is what I have just relayed to you when we conduct our random inspection. I know that reporting is very important for us. And sometimes the more unsafe acts, the more unsafe condition that you report, the better for you. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. But I, I, I've, I've, known, I've known some safety risk and safety practitioners who enjoys writing unsafe acts, unsafe conditions. But of course, that's not our point. Our point is, actually our point should be, there should not be any unsafe act, unsafe condition if we're saying that we are exercising or we are implementing or we have a robust health and safety management system. Um, uh, uh, if our goal is to establish um, a safe worker, a safe workplace, then we should not be writing anything. Instead, we should be enhancing what we already have. So here, the hallmark is all about uh, having the expertise in building and retaining the talent of the person, um, say for example, those who are reporting directly to you or us ourselves, okay? We, as the risk and safety leader, we should build on expertise in retaining the talent of the people who are reporting to us. But the question is, if you are not socially aware, how can you build relationship with other people? There will be no uh, appropriate connection between us and uh, between between uh, us as the leader and the people below us. That's all about social awareness. And then, lastly, relationship management. How do we manage relationship with other people? With other people, uh, this is this is all about our capacity, our capability in managing relationship and establishing connection with other people. It is also our ability to find common ground and build rapport or build consensus. 
uh, are we on the same track with uh, with the people that we manage uh, or the people that we want to to safely carry out uh, the the task so that the project will finish on time or earlier without compromising health and safety and rather than focusing on on own uh, success first we as leaders if we have very good uh, relationship management uh, we help we tend to help others develop them and make them shine right so maybe some of you here can say you have mentored you have coach uh, uh, safety people who are who, who used to be under you and now they are uh, QHSE managers so I congratulate you for that but if you're still trying to work on uh, uh, having people succeed then try to look at how's your relationship with these people and how do you manage that relationship um, having also a, a, a very good relationship management is about managing di disputes and being excellent in communication. So again, communication is really uh, vital for us. As we all know that uh, at the workplace, there are so many ways that we can communicate. But the question is, how successful did we communicate and what was the impact of com the, the things that we have communication com that we have communicated with others? And also, uh, in depth or adept at managing uh, teams, uh, are we good in convincing others? Well, not convincing that because we, we want them to dance in our own music, but of course, uh, for a common objective that we want, that we desire, especially in carrying out a project, that everyone left their country, everyone everyone left their accommodation in one piece. At the end of the day, we all go back home in one piece. At the end of the contract, we all go back to our country in one piece. And of course, the trademark here, the hallmark or, or things that can really be uh, branded to us as having a good relationship management as our characteristics in emotional intelligence is that uh, we should be effective in leading change. We should be effective in leading change. Again, uh, earlier in self-management, we talk about openness to change. If we are closed-minded to change, even at, at a personal level, we cannot be effective in leading change. And we should be able to persuade people. If we cannot persuade people, not because, uh, not because, uh, um, uh, we want, we want uh, uh, personally, we want to achieve something, but it, it, it's all because of a common goal. We should have that uh, ability to to convince, to persuade, and to let people be with us in one direction, traversing the the uh, uh, objective of uh, successfully finishing a project without any uh, incident, without any injury or harm to the uh, equipment materials in the environment. And um, we should also be expert, uh, well, not really expert, but at least we can work out to becoming good and eventually to become expert in building and leading the teams as we are all known to be risk and safety leaders. And by virtue of that, it should be our inherent, uh, inherent talent uh, to build and lead teams. So, um, Goldman, um, in in the uh, five components of emotional intelligence, divided it, divided the five into personal competence and social competence. And personal competence uh, will determine how we manage ourselves, and social competence determines how we handle relationship. So. Uh, there were four earlier, as uh, described by Goldman, uh, as the uh, four characteristics, but let's try to go uh, further into the emotional competence framework. So first one is self-awareness. So we already talked about this now um, in the characteristics, but uh, I, I just want to go further that uh, self-awareness is all about, again, uh, we need to know uh, our internal state. Um, Guys, um, what, was there even was there even a time in your being a risk and safety practitioner that you sit that you that you sat you were able to sit down and think about yourselves yourself about your internal state? Perhaps there were also times that uh, when it comes to uh, preferences, uh, whatever preferences they may be, uh, food. Uh, brand of uh, safety apparel, 
uh, resources, uh, perhaps uh, resources when it comes to uh, things that we need so that we can properly, adequately exercise our uh, being a risk and safety professional. Uh, which one, which which one would you want to choose? Uh, which one would you want to opt to to take, especially uh, when it comes to uh, our personal advancement um, in uh, uh, availing some uh, training uh, training programs, and all and also our intuitions about how we feel on how things will take place. So that's all about self-awareness. We need to be aware of our own emotion. And of course, uh, I'm highlighting here accurate, the word accurate in self-assessment because um, if at first when you assess yourself, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, there, there are some, some um, uh, emotional intelligence, uh, uh, what to call this, it's not a survey, it's about a test, a personal test that will give you a very interesting result. Um, I, I, I have done it myself. I just cannot show it to you because that's very personal. Uh, but I encourage you that you go to the internet and search for emotional intelligence self-assessment. And again, uh, self-confidence here is also very important if you really want to um, gauge ourselves, how aware are we when it comes to personal competence. And the second one is self-regulation. Again, uh, this is all about our self-control, uh, being trustworthy, how diligent are we when, when, we're in, when it comes to things related to our being a risk and safety practitioner, how adaptable are we when it comes to um the situation and uh, do we innovate do we come up with ideas uh, that can further enhance or provide resolution to some issues that we may face with and then uh, empathy um, this is all about awareness of other feelings needs and concern um, how how do we understand and develop others of course um, if we are if we are leaders we need to look at First of all, the physi physiological needs of the people under us, are they well provided? If they're not well provided, then uh, what do we need to do? Uh, if there's nothing that we do, that means that, uh, again, I just want to, 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 to uh, capture what I've just said. If there's nothing that we do, in other words, if, if we do not do something to the people who do, who do not have uh, who are not provided with their physiological needs, then we don't have that empathy, and we may we, we may not we may not be even sympathizing with those people. Why? Because we are not aware of their feelings, their needs, and their concern. And so here, uh, we need to be oriented when it comes to serving them. Um, being a risk and safety professional is also about servant leadership. You cannot, you cannot be, as we always say, um, in in health and safety, we are we we are called leaders. So if you want to, if you want to lead, you need to serve these people. You are not. If you if you are if you are saying that you are a safety manager, perhaps part of you is still being as a safety leader, right? And also leveraging diversity. If in 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 a group. Uh, especially in this place where we have uh, people coming from different parts of the world, then we can leverage. We can leverage. We can we can behave in a way that uh, we are the unifying factor. We 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 are able to uh, uh, mingle with these people. We are able to bring them together, and uh, we can we can share each other's emotion. And of course, we can also uh, become aware of uh, political. I'm not talking about politics of the country, but uh, uh, the, the the politics at the workplace. If you're really sensitive to what's happening at the workplace, then you can have what we call the political awareness. And then the social skills or the social awareness that we, we talked earlier, uh, which is all about proficiency at inducing um, desirable results from other people. How do we influence them? 
how do we communicate with them how do we manage conflict how do we lead people and how do we how do we become a catalyst how do we mediate or how do we become the uh, unifying uh, unifying factor and then how do we how do we uh, establish or the, how do we bind with others so that we can establish a very good working uh, uh, safe working uh, rapport with each other so that's uh, uh, social awareness um, let's always try to remember that uh, the people under us the frontliners they are human beings and with that um, we can say that they naturally bound and uh, often trained to work quickly and compete compete here uh, is, is is all about you know uh, unknowingly you you get to notice that uh, each and every one they have their own skills they have their own abilities um, according to their trades and of course competition is is always there but uh, always think about a healthy competition rather than uh, an unhealthy competition where people will end up having uh, friction or that would create faction at the workplace and um, EI, uh, EI training teaches safety leaders to recognize that human brain is wired, is connected for both emotion and sense. Okay, we we all know what 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 do, do we mean by sense? Um, the the five senses and and the reality. So, um, at the workplace, we as leaders, if we know how is how to establish the four plus one characteristics or let's say just four characteristics of emotional intelligence uh, social awareness uh, relationship management uh, self-regulation if we know how to gauge ourselves it will be easy for us to bring this down to the people whom we lead right we will be able to teach them if not directly teach them we can be an example of how we connect to other people by merely understanding their emotion why because we first understand our own emotion and that becomes easy for us to understand other people's emotion as well and 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 we should be able to recognize that right away okay thirdly um one example at the workplace is the uh, lockout tagout uh, for example um, there's an electrical work and uh, uh, it's imperative that uh, um, lockout tagout either policy or regulation has to be implemented so sometimes when the work when when lockout tag out takes longer it, it affects the emotion of other people as well because it requires downtime and then when it requires downtime what do people end up to they they will lose their time they will not become productive or chances are they might not get their one day salary so imagine you are at the workplace but because of lack of tag out uh, process you don't get your one day salary so you as a leader we as a leader how would we react to this how would we connect ourselves to other people so perhaps for, first of all we need to understand we, we ourselves we need to understand the process of lockout tagout and then we need to connect this to the emotion of other people if this takes longer or if this takes a, a shorter time than expected and as safety leaders it is our job to encourage people below us to slow things down and keep emotions in check so one question here that I, I i i want to challenge you is do you once in a while do you once in a while go around not to do a safety check but to connect with people so so perhaps this is one challenge that you will that you will uh, capture from me tonight the question of do you once in a while go around not to conduct safety inspection but instead to connect with people even just to say hi or perhaps when you notice someone someone you may not know um uh, gets in 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 your path right away even just to tap the shoulder of that person or just to say hello how are you uh, how are things how's work I, I guess that would matter already right so please do if you can 
uh, that would that would create that would that would establish a very good connection between you and the people that you are supervising or leading and also by gaining uh, insight into other people's ability to to remain in control and to uh, establish the correct type of thought process and behaviors in response to stress so emotional intelligence uh, at the workplace it can happen it it can develop it can develop people's ability to become productive to become uh, more aware of uh, uh, what risk and safety is all about. If if we the leaders, if we the the, the safety leaders, knows how to 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 uh, gauge our, ourselves and how to find out our ability to stay in control, then that would be good for each and every one at the workplace. Now there's there's one. Uh, 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 very good uh, uh, expression here that I found, uh, which was stated by uh, Dr. Uh, Daryl Grieg. Okay, he's the co-developer of American Express Emotional Competence Program, and he says that if people will stop for a moment and put themselves in another person's shoes, it will help them modify their own behavior. It will help them develop relationships with those people. Guys, this is a very interesting thing. Just like what I mentioned in my in in, in my last slide uh, earlier about connecting with people. Okay, so try to put yourselves in the shoes of other people. Like for example, if we scold someone, if we scold someone, let's try to put ourselves in in, in the shoes of that person being scolded, because otherwise we will not be able to know. How does it feel like if we're not gonna do that? Okay, so this is just uh, one reminder for us. So, how do we establish an effective workplace risk and safety relationship? First of all, employing our uh, emotional competencies um, is imperative. Um, becoming self-aware, uh, knowing how to manage or how to regulate ourselves, being aware of uh, what's around us, who are around us, and managing our relationship so that we can build positive influence on others. So that way, if you if you start building positive influence on others, you're also trying to, to take them up with you. We're not trying to put them down. And also by establishing an accord towards forming a team and achieving goals. Um, we are we are the catalyst as as we've said earlier we are the catalyst of uh, unifying all people into a common goal where we want to achieve um uh 2 million hours without any incident okay 2 million hours without any incident and uh, by ensuring that um everyone leaving their accommodation excited to go to work and then also going back home, excited to again spend the, the next the next hours with their friends in the accommodation without any ill feelings towards uh, their fellow worker, towards the foreman, and towards the safety uh, manager or the safety officer. And also by encouraging ourselves to be an inspiration to others to achieve desired goals. So th this is how we can establish uh, effective workplace relationship, risk and safety relationship. Um, in terms of uh, uh, gauging our emotional intelligence. So what's the real, the real payoff here? The real payoff here is that um, we who are already leaders, before we became leaders, we, we were those people who, uh, who did perform our job with, uh, uh, what to call this, with flying colors. And we were the ones who who had the strength in the key emotional intelligence abilities, and this is what exactly Dr. Daniel Goldman is 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 talking about. Those people who become who will become the leaders, the people who will become the star performers, are the ones who have the strengths in the key emotional intelligence abilities. So, guys, maybe we are so we are we are just unmindful that. But before before we became who we are right now, 
we already had the uh, we already had these abilities but unfortunately we were not able to decipher what are those that we can consider as part of or are characteristic of our emotional intelligence and again those are self awareness self uh, uh, regulation self management uh, social awareness and manage, ma managing relationships right now so as it matters at the workplace um, there are people with uh, high emotional intelligence and there are people with low emotional intelligence i i'm, I'm not going to go deep into this but the the challenge here is that uh, how do we know if people have high emotional intelligence and if we know that there are people in our group with low emotional intelligence by virtue of of, of this uh manifestation on how they behave how do we manage them because we have to remember that 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 people with low emotional intelligence can be risk at the workplace right it's it's not the person per se but it's about the emotion of the person and therefore so that we can manage that emotion we need to manage that person so that's that's the challenge because it matters at the workplace again as i've told you our goal is to have a safe worker and to have a safe workplace correct so once you notice that a person is, is um, uh, manifesting some signs and symptoms of low emotional intelligence, we must manage that right away, of course, in a subtle way, right? So uh, here's, here's now the impact of not recognizing negative emotions. So in the scenario which, which uh, uh, we've started with, um, the moment we fail to acknowledge negative emotions, we have to remember that this can narrow down people's way of thinking. So what happened to those frontline workers when they got scolded? Right away or gradually, it, it, well, most of the time it's, 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 um, uh, it's an immediate or it's an instant reaction, uh, human as we are. It, what happened was the, the negative emotions narrowed down their way of thinking and that's what created their ill feelings their bad feelings towards the foreman and towards the safety people so again uh let's uh this brings us back to to um uh i don't know if you can still call it a myth or it's really a fact but i just hope that uh uh we will just we will just eventually let's consider this as a myth that uh, safety people are always the enemy of most of the people in a project right i i, I don't know if you'll agree with me or not um, also, this put limitation or creates barrier to in interpretation of events. So, why why were there people who were not complying with the PPE requirements at the project site? So, there was a barrier. There was a barrier. There was perhaps communication was was not uh, was not taking place uh, uh, appropriately, and also unreceptive behavior. So. If the people who were corrected by by a, a safety officer with the right character of an emotional intelligence, that could have not resulted to unreceptive behavior. Unreceptive behavior means that they will they will react adversely. See, and it also it manifests disengaged behaviors. And once once there's a disengagement of behavior. Guys, you have to take note that it will take you quite some time to recoup or to re-engage that behavior. And, and you have to remember that people who do not know that they have low emotional intelligence, this can prolong over a period of time. And also, failure to acknowledge negative emotion can slow down performance resulting to unsafe act and unsafe condition so always let's always also uh, try to uh, remember this that uh, it can slow down performance and it can even result to uh, personal harm or injury damage to equipment damage to material and damage to the uh, general environment also it can cause people to be more easily agitated adversely and guys failure to acknowledge negative emotions can have an enduring effect okay so here's the challenge. Uh, we need to learn how to listen to others. We need to express our sympathy 
and if is that that sympathy if it will really connect with the person or if there's a very good uh, relationship management it can even go down to a deeper uh, as a deeper uh, uh, gauge of uh, empathy and then we need to reflect on risk and safety related things which we, which may be discovered at the workplace and then lastly um, we need to exercise our competence on assessing emotional intelligence risk assessment. So, um, according to uh, uh, Dale Carnegie, when dealing with people, remember you are not dealing with creatures of logic, but creatures of emotion. So, look at these challenges and then think about how you can improve emotional intelligence in the practice of risk and safety at your workplace at a very personal level. Okay, our key takeaway tonight is that workplace emotional intelligence is the key to a successful risk and safety management. So I guess, I guess you will agree with me tonight that the first thing that we need to do is to, uh, to, to assess ourselves, to assess and to reassess ourselves. If we realize tonight that there, there are parts of us that leads to a disconnected a uh, working relationship with other people resulting into poor compliance of health and safety, then we have to work on it. Um, let's remember that an emotionally confident safety leadership builds trust and awareness of the general work environment and beyond so that we can establish a better way of thinking for emotional intelligence. And EI in risk and safety practices can be nurtured, it can be enhanced by encouraging soft skills like courage, confidence, and many more. Okay? Soft skills like courage. How how do we how do we um, develop people not to be uh, afraid of things and that they can have also confidence? And then the right way of workplace communication and expressing compassion for others can surely make its worker emotionally strong. This is one thing that we can uh, build upon uh, emotional strength. And whenever we exercise good emotional intelligence, this will result to effective and efficient risk and safety management. Otherwise, guys, conduct a suitable and sufficient emotional intelligence risk assessment. So these are my presentation credits, which I've uh, taken some of the content of my presentation. And if there's any question, uh, I, I, I did not hear uh, Suzanne uh, uh, interrupting me for some questions she might have seen in the chat box or hands raised. So this is now your opportunity to ask question um, uh, within the bounds of uh, what we have, uh, what I have presented to you tonight. Thank you, um, Leo. We, there's actually some questions that come through. Um, so there was a comment from Mohammed, and he said safety personnel must be appointed by government, being hired by contractors and subcontractors, which means you have to save your job and workforce um, at the same time, which is impossible to impose in um, OHSE rules. So this is what this was a comment. Um, there was a question from Asset. He said, "How to build self-trustworthy and integrity?" All right. I, I I like that question. How to build? Uh, what's the first word? I can I only remember Self, integrity. Yeah. So how to build self-trustworthy and integrity? Okay. Um. I, I guess um. You yourself. Uh, can 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 feel um, are you trustworthy enough to implement health and safety your your health and safety policy so uh, one way is are people following you um, when you say that this policy th this policy has been rolled out and I'm monitoring the implementation of the policy what's the question is what's the result because if there's no result and you have people uh, ending up getting injured you have equipment getting damaged you have materials being misused or abused then there's a question of being trustworthy okay that's a question uh, are, are you being uh, uh, trusted enough to implement such things then the result is the answer 
uh, if the result is yes, people are complying. Yes, uh, I have very good connection with these people. Whenever I request something for, from them uh, to, to do something that's related to what we do, uh, they listen to me, then that's being trustworthy. In other words, when you are, tra when you are um, what to call this, when you're given that responsibility, uh, what's the result of that? And then how to build integ integrity? Well, it takes time to establish integrity. Okay, integrity and trust. It does. They don't happen overnight. You have to work. You have to work on it. Thank you, Leah. Another question that came through. That's this is from Plesser. He said, "How how do you detect a worker is stressed? Do you have a guideline or health checklist if he or she is fit to work or stress?" Okay. Um, the uh, the uh, QCS 2014 as a regulatory document. Um, try to read it, and there are six there are six factors um, that that you can see, and you will know if the person is stressed. Like for example, um, unclear responsibility, uh, work demand, um, management support. So if there's if there's Okay, let, 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 let's, it, let's make this very straightforward. You as part of the management, have you been supporting the workforce? If you've been supporting the workforce, how do they behave? Like for example, in PPE, if you're purchasing poor quality PPE just because you're thinking of cost saving, what happens to these PPEs? Okay, people, people, the workers can easily detect if the PPE are, are if the PPE are good or not. And that will also reflect how much support the management has to the workers. And 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 also compliance to wearing this PPE will also uh, be a sign of uh, a support from the management. And you will see around you, do you see uh, head protection that are rolling on the ground and without straps? Do you see gloves that that can still be used but are uh, but are scattered on the on the ground? The, 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 if you see these things, think about think about one thing: people are 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 stressed, and these people are not putting value to what what are given to them by the company. So one one key word there is how much do people value you as safety officer? How much your people value the management when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, considering it as a stress factor? So there are there are six elements which which I just cannot uh, <clears throat> expound anymore. But that's part of the regulatory the requirement that uh, that we talked about earlier. Thank you very much, Leo. Another question from Ravi is: How would you recognize an emotional multilingual workers in the workplace? Okay. <clears throat> um, use people who understands the language of that person. Okay, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's always someone who knows the dialect, if not really the language, is the dialect of that person. Use a mediator. And of course, you yourself, as a safety leader, you have to gauge your emotional intelligence uh, uh, as well so that you'll be able to, to read, you'll be able to, to determine uh, the emotional uh, uh, intelligence level of that person. That's just an example, but there are so many ways that you can gauge the emotional uh, level of the person. Thank you, Leo. Um, Ravi, also, for how would you analyze or assess the emotional consequences? Okay. Um, if 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 we are familiar with the five steps to risk assessment, um, I, I guess I guess uh, most of us here uh, can can with 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 eyes closed can memorize the five steps to risk assessment. First of all identify the hazard and uh, the associated risk so what's the hazard if the person is 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 behaving uh, questionably again the the next question to that is what's the risk of this uh, uh, person behaving uh, questionably okay and then who can be affected and then uh, of course then proceed to the third step uh, to evaluate the risk and then do your control measure and and again on the last five, on the last uh, step of risk assessment is uh, uh, 
uh, review your risk assessment. So if you want to find out, if you want to assess what can be what can be the consequence, start from step one of identifying that person, how that person behaves, and then who can be affected. Remember, in my in my earlier slide, I said that the people element of the uh, operational elements of the business is the most critical factor. Why? Because the people has got the emotion, and whenever something goes wrong with the emotion, the equipment, the materials in the environment will be affected as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Leo. Um, so there's another question is how to deal with negative emotions rise among workers once receiving directives from management all right it, it, it depends it depends um what are the factors that have caused the worker to behave negatively okay or to to uh, demonstrate negative emotion that is again i will go back to risk assessment because if you do not know what's the reason then you'll it will be difficult to find a solution so if the problem is the safety officer then um do something with the safety officer if uh, uh if uh, uh the problem is the ppe then do something with the ppe it, it's just about uh, uh what to call this the skills of troubleshooting okay it's just about the skills of troubleshooting so if you know if if you as the direct report of that person knows how to troubleshoot this these things it will be easy for you particularly in our skills in conducting risk assessment thank you leo um so another question is what if the person who is showing poor emotional intelligence are those people in the top management what can we do to influence them to have better emotional intelligence uh, okay right first of all we need to be a catalyst remember if we are in the middle management when it comes to implementing what the management wants us to do we are the link of the management towards the people towards the people that we we lead or we supervise okay so if if you are in between try to check how do the people below us behave how do the people above us behave then we need to be a catalyst how can we become a catalyst first of all we ourselves we need to demonstrate we need to demonstrate those four characteristics benchmarking on the hallmarks of the uh, emotional intelligence okay if if we do not possess those characteristics first of all we have to work on ourselves so that we will be able to know if those people above us are having or behaving uh, appropriately when it comes to uh, uh, the level of emotional intelligence now the answer is very simple be a catalyst okay be a catalyst of um uh, catalyst of change right by by demonstrating that you are competent enough in your job and of course establishing good uh, relationship uh, with these people and influencing them the way you're influencing other people with your level of emotional intelligence thank you leo so another question is how to sorry how to encourage the emotional factor of the workforce for their proactive approach towards safety all right first of all look at your policy um are your policies are your policies stating that workers should be engaged and then what's the culture around you um if the culture around you um is questionable first uh, do some strategy or find out find out what are the causes that these people are that 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 what you're seeing from these people needs to be changed okay and then slowly um identify the factors once you've identified the factors then try to mitigate mitigate those factors um starting from um uh, you can do both ways starting from those critical ones or from those that are uh, benign ones and then try to uh, monitor monitor the change that may take place 
um, and you can and you can uh, what to call this you can monitor you can monitor uh, the overall performance of, of, of the mitigation uh, strategy that you did so again again let, let me just reiterate this again it, it's all about us and, and I like I like that question how do you see people how do you look at people and what you can do again it will start from us again it's all about connecting with the people because if we don't connect to the people no matter how much we troubleshoot the problem the problem will remain as they are so again it's all about connecting the dots so that we can establish a solid line that would create a very strong connection among each and every one of us making it what you call the rapport thank you so much leo um I think that's all for the questions but if you have any questions that you haven't had a chance to pop down um you can pass it to training.rsm.org and we're happy to pass it on to leo or um you know if leo wish to be um uh, directly approached then um I'm, I'm sure um he can let you know at the end of the presentation um but yeah thank you everybody to um that joined us today um, and thank you so much leo for a very formative um session um and i'll end the presentation now and this will be uploaded on youtube so you can catch up as well on our youtube channel thank you so much leo and thank you everybody for joining us have a good rest of the evening likewise susan and thank you everyone good night